Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. Heavenly Father, please help us now to hear your word. Establish it firmly in our hearts, that our lives may reflect your glory, bringing honour and praise to your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please do be seated. We're on page 450, looking at Psalm number 8. Now, question to begin with. Does the name James Webb mean anything to you? Anyone? Yes. Oh, I can hear it. Yes, that's good. Well, James Webb was the uh, NASA administrator in the 1960s and he led during the Apollo space program. And in recognition of his work there, the latest space telescope, successor to the Hubble, has been named after him, the James Webb Space Telescope. And its mission, to quote from NASA, is to unfold the infrared universe. Now this telescope, which orbits the sun, has taken an image from, if you can get your head around this, 470 light years away. And it shows in this, I, I, actually, if you came to the 1030 service, you got, you'd see an actual image of it. Um, it shows what looks like a question mark. And it seems that um, when galaxies merge together, they fling stars and gas into long streams called tidal tails. And, uh, and the curved shape that's made by one of these tidal tails could be a question mark. But whatever it is, it's caused speculation and some amusement in scientific circles. But it's a serious reminder that there are big questions about our universe which remain a mystery. Science does not have all the answers. Asking questions is something that people of faith have done for thousands of years. And in Psalms 6, 10, 13 and 79, just to name a few, we hear the questioning cry, How long, O Lord? And in Psalm 8, the last in our short summer series, we hear another question, not a How long, O Lord? cry from the midst of suffering or injustice, but a cry that bursts forth out of sheer awe-inspired wonder. Now today's passage, if you look at it, if you have your Bible open there, um, and perhaps you already noticed that the first and last lines are the same. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So it's like a sandwich. The shout of praise sandwiches the verses in between, it encloses and surrounds the filling of this psalm, highlighting its big theme, which is celebrating the glory and grace of God, who he is and what he's done. It's a wonderful and beautifully written hymn of praise, and we're going to look at it under three headings, all beginning with a W, and the first W is worship. So, as we said, the psalm opens, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Lord, if you notice in there, is written in capital letters because it is the covenant name of God, Yahweh, the God who keeps his promises and whose glory fills the earth. And this God is also our Lord, who cares for us. His name describes his character. And King David, like all Christian believers, can enjoy a personal relationship with the one true and living God. Well, the psalm continues, You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and to the avenger. And we're beginning to see a paradox, don't we? The Lord God, whose glory fills the heavens, is also glorified by the praise of the weak and helpless, by the voices of children and their simple, unaffected trust in a loving God. Well, there was a renowned Swiss theologian, the author of many deep and scholarly books, and he was once asked, what is the most important thing you've learned from all your studies? And he answered, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. 
Do you remember that chorus from Sunday school? Yes, of course you do. Well, God's praise is sung by the angelic heavenly choirs, as we hear from Isaiah's vision, when the seraphim call to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And yet, he delights in the praise of children, uncomplicated songs of praise, not solid with scepticism, but pure, unadulterated, joyful praise. God is glorified in simplicity of faith, both in children and in the childlike, humble and trusting faith of all believers. You know, teaching our children about Jesus is more important now than it has ever been. Because there's many aspects of social media which are having an unsafe influence on what younger generations think and do. So that without proper guidance, they're being cast adrift to face the storms of life without any clear direction or safe anchor. Now we can't halt the inexorable tide of technological advances, I hesitate to call it progress, but we can encourage parents, grandparents and teachers in helping our precious young ones to learn about the love of Jesus and by supporting events like the forthcoming Ladies' Breakfast on the topic of raising children in a confusing world. Yes, our Father in Heaven delights to hear all his children sing his praise. And when the children sang Hosanna to the Son of David at Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the chief priests and teachers of the law were angry. Jesus asked them if they never read the words from Psalm 8, from the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. Well, then, as now, those who are against God cannot see his glory. They're blind to his grace and left speechless in the face of true praise. So, from the heights of heaven, from angelic choirs to children's voices, God's praise is sung. His majesty and glory is declared in every corner of the earth, where, since the creation of humankind, men and women have looked up into the night skies and asked the same question, what is man? Verses 3 and 4 say, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? And the study of the stars and more recently travelling into space has always been a fascination. Just think back to the Magi, those early astronomers whose searching of the stars led them to the infant Jesus to kneel before the light of the world in worship and adoration. And because of light pollution, most people in this country who live in towns or cities don't get to see the full glory of the night sky. And it's good that we have dark sky reserves I believe the best area, the area in Northumberland, is the best in this country. But when this psalm was written, around 1,000 years before the birth of Jesus, we can perhaps imagine David lying on his back, staring up at a clear, starry sky, practically unchanged from then to now, as he asked himself this question. He was in no doubt that God was the creator of the universe. Big Bang theories, Hadron Colliders and so-called God particles hadn't been thought of. Huge telescopes like Hubble orbiting the Earth, the James Webb orbiting the Sun and others like the one of John Bank lay centuries in the future. But humans have always gazed in awe at the vastness of the skies to ponder our own place in the scheme of things. The comparison of infinite space with the finite me. Some would ask the question, how can God, a remote super being up there, possibly know or care about me? Well, the discoveries about the cosmos, finding out that our little galaxy, the Milky Way, is only one of around 200 billion galaxies. So those discoveries have, from a scientific perspective, done nothing to provide an answer to this question. David's question arises from a deep sense of praise and thanksgiving, of his amazement at God's wonderful grace. He knows we are specks of cosmic dust. 
He knows this because of his relationship with the Lord, the one true and living God, the name, the only name to be honoured in all the earth. And at the same time, with confidence, he can also call our Lord. And in Psalm 23, he can say, the Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd. And yet, this is the same God whose art history and word flung stars into space and created unimaginable expanses of galaxies, but who is also mindful and cares for each one of us. David was in God's mind, and so are we. We move from worship into our second heading, worth. We are our Heavenly Father's special concern. All God's children are precious in his sight, and as Jesus said, are much more worth than the birds of the air. All men and women have worth, dignity and value. All matter to the God of our creation, and our Christian voice should speak up where we see discrimination and injustice. We were made to enjoy God's gift of relationship with him and with one another. Only man and woman were made in the image or likes of God. Only us. We're not just animals. We bear, although distorted and marred, the image of our creator. And this is what should define us. And yet the world rejects this truth and says, I define who I am. I am how I look, I am what I eat, what I wear, what I do. I will decide for myself what I believe to be true. I am the centre of my own universe. But sadly that creed only leads further away from our God who is mindful of each one of us. Verse 5 con confirms that man is special, made in the likeness of the Creator and crowned with glory and honour to have dominion over the other creatures. Verses 6 to 8 are a summary of the delegated authority God gave to man over the animal kingdom, domesticated and wild, flocks and herds, beasts of the field, birds of the air, fish of the sea, and all other creatures that live in the oceans. And the first man, Adam, chose to turn away from the wise and loving rule of the Lord God. And so, because of sin, he lost the crown and forfeited the glorious dominion. And this fatal choice has been mankind's legacy. And in a quote from Pascal, the 17th century philosopher and mathematician, man is both the glory and the scandal of the universe. And we see, I think, this contradiction between chaos and beauty reflected in our own lives and in the world around us. And this confusion is highlighted if we try to find the answer to questions like what is man, or why am I here, or what is my purpose, from within ourselves, or by being tossed from one popular opinion to another. The simple truth is that Jesus, who came into the world to save sinners, loves us. He loves you, and he loves me. The Bible tells us so, and every person has worth and dignity and purpose. No one is beneath the notice of our loving and caring God, who has numbered even the hairs on our head. Well, the writer of the passage that Alice read to us from Hebrews picks up this theme from Psalm 8 and brings us the good news that in his eternal plan, our gracious God wanted to bring us back into a relationship where we worship and serve him in joyful obedience. That relationship had been spoiled by the sin of the first Adam, and only the sacrifice of his sinless son could pay the price for the sin of the world. It's only in Jesus, the second Adam, that this relationship is restored, put right again. The good news of the Gospel is that we are remade in Jesus, who is the perfect likeness of the living God. In his life, death and resurrection, Jesus regained the glorious dominion for us. And one day, those who believe in him will share it with him. In the Gospels, we read how in his earthly ministry, Jesus ex exercised the dominion that Adam lost over beasts, birds, fish, and well of nature itself. 
the Lord Jesus Christ is crowned in heaven and is exalted above all rule and authority, and all things are under his feet, even death, although there will only be complete fulfilment when he returns in power and majesty. His finished work on the cross heralded the dawn of his kingdom on earth. But like the sandwich of this star, we live sandwiched between Christ's two advents, between his first coming as a baby at Bethlehem and his second coming still to happen. And only the Father knows when this day will be. By faith we see Jesus crowned in heaven, and that gives us the assurance, the sure and certain hope, that one day we will reign with him and receive our crown, the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. In the meantime, we can only stand in wonder, that's the final and brief W, in words from the prayer of the general thanksgiving, if you recognise these words, that God's grace to us and to all people for our creation, preservation and all the blessings of this life. For as well as gazing in awesome wonder at the unfathomable expanses of the universe, as stewards of the earth, we can also wonder at the beauty of God's creation all around us. Everything God created, he said, was good, and he gave man charge over the created order to look after it. But we know only too well the impact of man's greed and abuse of the earth's natural resources. We hear constantly, don't we, about the effects of climate change, rising sea levels, increasing temperatures, wild wildfires. All these bring danger and devastation to nature and living creatures as well as to people. I wonder if you heard on the news this last week about the Indian spacecraft which landed at the south pole of the moon. Well, they, a rover vehicle from that will explore the lunar surface for two weeks to hunt for ice and other signs of water. Scientists hope to find out more about the origin and evolution of the moon, as well as its potential future for human habitation. Well, to me that doesn't sound like a very inviting prospect. Better surely that we protect and treasure what we have been blessed with, because despite it all, the earth remains God's creation. We all have a responsibility, however limited, to be wise and good stewards, never ceasing to wonder at the abundance, diversity and amazing beauty all around us. And so we come to the closing verse, a repeat of the first. This psalm of praise to the glory and grace of God has reminded us that we are created to worship the Lord God. In the words of the hymn, creator of the rolling spears, ineffably sublime. But we've also seen how our gracious God is our Lord. He made us in his own image, that by trusting his loving rule, we may live in relationship with him. And even though, because of man's rebellion, sin spoiled that image, God did not abandon his people. He is mindful of each one. All have worth and are precious in his sight. And to keep his promise, he sent Jesus to restore that image, because being like Jesus is the will of God for the people of God. Those who believe and trust in Jesus are remade, and as we look to him alone, we discover our new life in him, in all its fullness. But we must keep looking, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, as we learn to follow in his way, knowing that one day we will receive the crown of life as we worship him, lost in wonder, love and praise. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth.